Right, I think we are live. Yeah, uh, a very good evening, uh, one and all who are online today uh, on our first session of Enterprise Wednesday uh, for Enterprise at APU uh, as part of uh, our uh, bi weekly uh, sessions to bring on uh, entrepreneurs uh, to share uh, their journey with us. Yeah, uh, welcoming into the year, the Tiger. This is our first session for the year. So today we have a very uh, uh, a wonderful and uh, a very uh, professional person uh, whom I've met once uh, when he came to campus. And uh, we have Jim Simon, uh, who actually resides in Singapore and uh, uh, who's part of uh, Quantum, uh, which is a large Silicon Valley corporation uh, uh, headquarters in, 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 in the US, in Silicon Valley itself, uh, and having started his business uh, in 1998. Uh, uh, also, uh, Jim uh, is now uh, moved up. Uh, he first started as the, uh, uh, the head of marketing for Asia Pacific. Uh, then he became a director for the Singapore office, and uh, uh, he's also a Singapore permanent resident. So welcome to the to the region permanently, Jim. Uh, and then uh, he has actually moved on to a, a global uh, role uh, in the field. Uh, uh, for the same field, uh, uh, and also uh, in channel marketing uh, in 2018. Uh, but off recently, uh, since 2020, I think the pandemic has brought uh, a, a good uh, uh, round of luck uh, for, for, for Jim, because now uh, he's also the GM, uh, the general manager of Quantum, uh, 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 the Kuala Lumpur's uh, uh, Center of Excellence, yeah? uh, which has over 100 plus members uh, representing different functional operations uh, for the quantum group so welcome on board jim uh, and also you. nicholas uh, who's my partner in crime today uh, we're going to have a wonderful session this evening uh, bringing in uh, the spirit of entrepreneurship into 2022 uh, which uh, we left behind uh, in a very uh, uh, strong manner uh, for 2021 uh, jim, jim welcome on board uh, we're glad to have you uh, what we'll do is uh, will allow you to uh, uh, basically uh, make your presentation. I know you have a, a, a short presentation uh, and uh, uh, your presentation is always uh, uh, definitely excite us because it's covering uh, uh, what is the gold mine of today, which is data. And uh, we're going to allow you to make that presentation. I'm going to give the floor to yourself. And, um, and then uh, we will shoot in a couple of questions. I know Nicholas is all set. Uh, he's been fiery since uh, this morning. Uh, he's waiting to shoot in some questions uh, uh, on behalf of the, uh, the youth, if I want to call them, uh, with regards to data, entrepreneurship, uh, the market demand of the current uh, market scenario and environment. So over to you, Jim, and uh, we're so happy to have you on board. Uh, uh, and your title today, Knowing Your Market and Data Analytics and How Data is uh, the forefront of any uh, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial venture. So the floor is yours, Jim. Thank you, Professor Vinesh. And uh, as Professor Vinesh said, uh, we met a month ago along with Professor Angelina. And I just want to say I was so struck by the, the beauty of your campus. It made me feel like I wanted to go back to school. If I'm going to do a PhD in marketing, I might do it at APU. So uh, I can't wait to come back. And in fact, Quantum and APU are working together on a really interesting project. We'll get into it a little bit. Uh, I want to promise you today is not a sales presentation in any way. Although, as Professor Vinesh said, uh, our KL office has over 104 people. Uh, I think it's 105 as of today. And we're constantly looking for people. So if you are or you know someone that's in the job market, quantum.com forward slash careers and uh, please apply right there. And you'll also give you my contact info at the end. So that's the end of the sales bit. Uh, I'll just say that uh, I'm really looking forward. I, I hope this will be a fun session for you as well. Uh, I started you know, in 1998 as a product manager for Quantum in Silicon Valley. When I got there, I said, oh my gosh, this is a company I could work the rest of my career at. And, and Quantum was my third employer. And here I am almost 25 years later and uh, that's true today. So could we please go to the slides and I'll just jump right in. Uh, 
All right. So this is Quantum's title slide. And the reason I want to just pause here for a second is our tagline. The difference is in your data. That is really important. If that's the one thing to take away from this, it is the differences in your data. So I'd like to give you some examples of different markets. I'd like to, to show you how you have data on the one hand, and then you have market opportunity on the other. And if you can bring these together, you can really profit uh, yourself as the future entrepreneurs out there, or whether you're working for a company that is not your own. Either way, uh, there's some great opportunities. So why don't we take a quick look and uh, I'll see if I can go to the next slide here. What gets measured gets done. This is something that I learned when I was in business school a long time ago. And it is true. It's amazing how many things do not get measured <laughs> and therefore they don't get done. I, I can tell you that just yesterday, I was tracking down a request from a customer who asked us for a demo, and we didn't respond to his request. So he came to me personally. I saw my name on the internet, and I was uh, immediately on it. And now I'm tracking why we didn't see his response. And so we need to have a better system in place to make sure that we're responding to people that ask for help in a in literally minutes, not in days. So that's a real life example of what gets measured gets done. Try and measure everything. And you probably say, well, what, what do you mean, Jim? In the next few slides, I'm going to give you an example through a few stories. All right. How many people have seen Brad Pitt in this movie, Moneyball? Uh, if you have a few of you, huh? This is one of my favorite movies, and it led me to read the original novel that the, the book, sorry, that the movie is based on. You don't need to know anything about baseball to really love this movie. Uh, what's interesting about it is you had a team in Oakland, which is the poor cousin to San Francisco, that had a very small budget to pay for its players. And yet they found a way to find undervalued players, go out and get them with the budget they had and did really well. They actually did as well as the New York Yankees who had the largest budget. And it, what's really interesting is if you look at the Jonah Hill character there, it's his first job after college and he knows a little bit of programming. He studied economics and he's telling Brad Pitt's character, who's the general manager of the team, your goal shouldn't be to buy players, which a lot of teams think about. Oh, he's a great hitter. Or he's a great fielder. Your goal really is to buy wins. And in order to buy wins, you need to buy runs. If that's the only part of baseball you really need to know. Cross the plate, you get runs. If you score more runs than your competitor, you win the game. So what he started to do was try and use data to be able to identify players that could do really well for the A's. And they made this change early in the season. It wasn't even prior to the season. And you can see there that they went on to win 20 consecutive games. Now that may not sound like a lot, but the winning team every year has a win rate record that is in the 650 range. So 65% of the games they win. So to win 20 in a row, for any of you uh, math geniuses out there, if you flip a coin, what are the chances you're gonna get heads 20 times in a row? It's infinitesimally small. So this is an incredible accomplishment. They, you can see they finished at 103 to 59 and uh, they made it to the playoffs. Actually, the Oak, this is based on a true story, the 2002 Oakland A's. And this really uh, woke up sports and all sports teams now use data analytics to an extent that you could probably hardly imagine. And uh, we just saw a couple days ago, the Super Bowl out of Los Angeles and the LA Rams also made some very big moves at, in between seasons, betting that they could make a Super Bowl team and they not only got to the Super Bowl, but they won it. So even if you don't care about the analytics part, there's a great movie, I, I highly recommend it. All right. Yeah, Jim. Jim, sure. I just want to. I want to jump in there. Uh, yeah. I love the uh, analogy of uh, of uh, or, or, or the uh, example you have given uh, in relationship to sports. I think uh, 
Moneyball was a great movie, uh, and and the story behind Moneyball was even uh, uh, greater because of the impact it had. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and and I like I follow American sports quite well. Uh, if I didn't tell you before, and yeah. I like the way you brought up the Rams because the Rams did uh, an acquisition uh, before the season started, and and, mm-hmm. and they, they switched quarterbacks, mm-hmm. and, and and the new quarterback came in and and they reinforced the attacking game and. Uh, the the actual uh, uh, defense was already intact, and then the offensive uh, uh, set of uh, plays improved, and they, they took it uh, very uh, surprisingly. They, they 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 took it through the playoffs, and they won the Super Bowl. But I think what 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 you have said is is basically making that change. But that change has to be formalized based on evidence of data, and I think that. The data that you're talking about, because uh, you can't really forecast uh, if you don't have enough data. So uh, a forecast of uh, of uh, of any market demand, uh, in, in this case, the market demand is very simple, right? In sports, it's just to win, uh, and and it it cannot guarantee uh, uh, based on uh, any just simple successful strategy, uh, because uh, without uh, uh, the strategy itself, without the correct data without the analytical process in place, uh, it's quite hard to make decisions on investment um, uh, and even uh, gaining further marketing support. So the resources that you want to allocate as what you uh, illustrated earlier uh, is very well hidden unless it is exposed with the constructive uh, uh, outcomes uh, from the analytic study uh, that one does. And, and, and you cannot just assume, uh, and 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 I think the analytics helps you to 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 justify some of the uh, actions to be taken from an investment or from a market uh, penetration perspective. Uh, and I think uh, by gauging total market demand explicitly, uh, you have a better uh, chance of controlling your your startup or your your your, your new venture's destiny. And I think that, that's the point I wanted to add on to what you said just now. And and don't you agree on on on, on the, the the fact that data is vital and pivotal in any uh, direction set for strategy movements in, in in a new market venture, for example? A hundred percent. It really uh, helps move the curtains away, so you can see what's underneath, and uh, and increases your chances. This year. Uh, if you watch the National Football League games on TV, some of the uh, broadcasters are doing real-time analysis on the odds. Like they'll say at the end of the first quarter, the odds of this team winning over the other team is now 73% based on historical data. And there, it's used throughout. Uh, and trying to break down stereotypes. Uh, again, you don't need to know football for this part, but... Uh, there is something called a field goal where you get a kicker who comes on out. Uh, it could be 45, 50 yards away. There's 70,000 people hoping this kicker misses it in the stadium and millions more on TV and everything's on him. I had the just blind luck to play golf with one of these kickers. He actually was the kicker for the LA Rams when I played with him, but this is years ago. And when we were on the golf course, I heard him mumbling to himself and I asked him, what are you saying? His name was Mike Lansford, if you ever want to look him up. And uh, I don't know if it's still true, but he was the all time scorer for the LA Rams because of the number of kicks that he made. And he chanted to himself before every swing of the, the golf club. And it went something like, I am Mike Lansford. I am the kicker for the Los Angeles Rams. My job is to kick this field goal. And he would just say it over and over again. And he told me the reason he does that is he shuts out all of the extraneous things so he can focus on that. Now, the reason I brought that up is because there is kind of a uh, superstition from the other team right when the kicker is about to kick it, call a timeout. Now, they call this icing the kicker. You don't have an unlimited number of timeouts. So to give up a timeout is very precious but they had this belief that if you could call a timeout at the last moment, you would break the concentration of the kicker, you would ice him. And then when he goes to actually attempt the field goal, he's gonna miss. 
And it turns out that data does not support icing the kicker works. So teams don't really do that anymore. Why waste a timeout on something that can't be backed up with data? There you go. So if you have any sports fans out there and you are very data minded, there is a ton of money to be made. Great job security in sports analytics. Right. I mean, I think performance analytics uh, is a it's a it's strengthening the game or, or any sport by uh, for itself. And I think uh, uh, there's more to come. Uh, I think it's going to be even tighter in terms of uh, time frames within a, a, a full game uh, and pre and post uh, outcomes as well. I'm going to let mm -hmm. you go back to your presentation because I know you you got some wonderful. Uh, image processing uh, uh, slides coming up. This next one is near and dear to my heart. Uh, while I work for Quantum and have for a long time, what I'm going to talk about in this slide is something that I have done on the side. It's not related to Quantum. Quantum is uh, not only aware of, but is not signed away, not part of it. So I want to ask uh, if anybody has heard of ALPR, Automatic License Plate Recognition. And what you're seeing in this uh, picture here is a laptop in a police cruiser. I want to take you back to 1989 when I found out that my local police department encourages people of the community, this is in California when I was living there, to go out with the police to see how they do their job. It's part of transparency and building trust with the community. So I got matched with a, a CI, CSI, just like you see on TV. And uh, I'm sad to say and happy to say I went to a, a live murder scene. Uh, just, a, just a note, if you uh, want to take a hat off of somebody, make sure he's not armed. This person uh, tried to steal the hat off of a man and it cost him his life. Sad as it is to say. So from there, I went on to do uh, my hometown's Citizen Police Academy in 2001. And uh, I was much younger then. I had good eyesight. And I was sitting in the passenger seat with the policeman. And as we would drive along, uh, California is very you know, car centric. The policeman would say to me, hey, can you read the license plate of that car that's three up and one lane over? there's something about that car that just doesn't look right to me, uh, the way they're driving, et cetera. And I would say, oh yeah, the license plate is four Bravo Delta Charlie 164. And he was typing with one hand in the laptop, just like you see this guy doing while trying to drive and listening to the radio and watching the traffic. And I mean, it's hard to believe we're not allowed to text today, yet this policeman was tasked with all of these things. So. He would type that into the uh, laptop, hit return through radio. It would send the license plate to a centralized server, run the plate and come back and say whether that car is clear or whether the person associated with the car, it has a warrant for his or her arrest, whether the car was uh, logged as stolen. And so they would do this. And especially at night, it was difficult. So I said to him, hey, why don't you get a camera in the car, you know, right on top and take a picture of every license plate that you come across and automatically run it through the database. And then it will tell you when these are here. And he said, you can do that. And I said, why not? He said, well, I've never heard of such a thing. So I started thinking it over and I eventually went to see if I could patent this. And uh, the patent attorney said, you know what, that sounds like a great idea. Don't get your hopes up. I don't, you know, it's probably already patented, but if you're willing to spend $500, I'll do a search for you. I had to know the answer. So I wrote a check for $500. A week later, he called me back and said, I can't believe it. No one has ever made this. I, by the way, I searched the web. It didn't exist. So that was in 2003. Later on that year, Quantum offered me the chance to come out here to Asia for a two to three year expat assignment. I'm what they call an expat failure. I never left. So that was 18 years ago. And the point is that uh, while I was here, a few companies came to the same idea. And although my patent application was public knowledge, nobody reached out to me to say, could we license from you or buy it from you? Um, and it turns out that this is now ubiquitous around the world. 
And I can tell you that I have licensed my patents. There's three of them related to this, uh, to multiple companies for very significant sums of money. So this all came from an idea of being in the field with somebody. I identified a problem and an opportunity at the same time, and I pursued it. It did take me a while. The patent wasn't issued until 2010, just to give you an idea. So that was seven years to do that. But uh, if you aren't quite aware, let me show you an example here from the US. Uh, with ALPR, this is one of thousands of examples that are out there. Uh, automatic license plate recognition, found a car that was wanted and uh, it was tied back to this uh, gentleman you see on the right hand side who was, ended up being booked for murder. And uh, if you wonder if it's in Malaysia, here's your answer. And so, as it turns out, I, I didn't even anticipate this. I was just trying to help the policeman do his job more efficiently. But I talked to a retired police chief and he told me, this is uh, at the time I was thinking of, um, of filing for the patent. He said, you know, policemen get in a lot of fender benders. Uh, that's where you just bump the car in front of you. If, if this system could allow them to focus more on driving and cut that down, that would pay for the system right there, which costs about $20,000 per car. And secondly, uh, he said, you know, sometimes people claim that we have profiled them in, in a way that might even be illegal. The system here wouldn't know. It's just running plates. It's not that thing about, hey, that person looks guilty to me. I want to run them through the system. And of course, it can run thousands and thousands of plates uh, in an hour, including traffic coming at it at full speed. So like that. So it's been a huge success around the world and, and I'm very happy for it. Obviously other people thought of it as well. So here's another lesson to take away. If you think you have a great idea, look to see if you can patent it right away. To use a lawyer for that, you can't do it on your own. And uh, maybe you can be the first and profit from that. Okay, uh, this is just uh, from Google. If you wanna look up the patent, just search for my name and ALPR and you'll see three different patents there. All right. Uh, anybody got an Apple Watch? Professor Vinesh, did I see an Apple Watch on you? I couldn't. I've got Apple Watch. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not an Apple um, Watch. It's an Android, yeah. An uh, Android Watch. OK. I'm going to get myself into the Apple bandwagon soon enough. <laughs> yeah, just as good. Uh, you know, I, I love my Apple Watch. I, I will always wear something like it because of the fact that I love all the data that it is collecting, how many steps I've done, what the number of um, flights of stairs I've gone up. Um, I love the heart part. I use that uh, when I'm exercising to make sure my heart rate doesn't get too high. And there are many examples of people sending a note to Apple saying, you know what, uh, my Apple Watch identified a different heart rhythm. It, as you can see here, it doesn't tell you you're having a heart attack, just tells you if your rhythm is off. And then they went to see a doctor and they find, oh, an artery is blocked. And so they uh, go in for proactive surgery. So the we're just at the beginning of using data, data collection to identify people's health. Uh, I think that if you just wanted to close your eyes and envision the future, we may have things where you get something um, in surgery put on your kidneys or on your liver. I know that sounds extreme, but I don't think it is. And so, you know, unfortunately, Steve Jobs died of pancreatic cancer. By all accounts, he would be alive today if he had known earlier and had taken action earlier. So, if we can identify how we're doing every single organ in our body, I think then uh, we will uh, be much healthier and we can all expect to live past 100. So just think about that. And uh, there's huge opportunities in the medical data field. Uh, all right. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Jim. Sure. Nicholas, yeah. go uh, About the Apple, I have a question for you. Like how, how does a company like Apple encourage startups to follow suit as it once was a startup itself? Well, Apple makes a lot of acquisitions. They're kind of quiet about it. Um, in fact, uh, uh, you know, they, they are very humble. Some companies brag about who they've uh, acquired, but if you, you'll see a story come out and say like, oh, Apple acquired 35 companies last quarter. 
And those are all startups because they're constantly out there looking for somebody that's got great technology. Probably one of the more famous uh, companies that they acquired is the, I forgot their name, but they invented Siri. So, oh, hey Siri, yeah. who invented Siri? Oh. Like it says on the box, I was designed by Apple in California. Oh, that was an unplanned demo. Uh, so <laughs> Siri's incorrect. I mean, yes, I guess since Apple bought that company, but uh, yeah, Siri's a great example of something they bought and integrated. Quantum ourselves actually is, uh, is an integration of many companies. In fact, in our KL office, which uh, is technically PJ right by A&W Root Beer, we have a team now uh, that went zero people a few months ago. We now have seven programmers. Uh, they're working on CatDV software, which we acquired from as a UK company a little over a year ago. So perfect example. So thank you, Nicholas. Thank you for the answer as well. Sure. All right. So I love aviation. Um, that's my, my hobby. And I can't play this video for you live, but you might want to check it out on YouTube. It occurred, uh, this video, maybe three weeks ago at Chicago Hare Airport, which, as you may know, Chicago gets some incredible snowstorms. And what's interesting about this video is that the pilots of the 747 lost their understanding of where they were taxiing on the airport, and they were not on the center line of the taxiway, and they ended up careening right through the luggage carts, and they even ingested a box. It's all on video. So uh, it severely damaged the aircraft. It cost a lot of money in, in damages. And the question I have for all of us is, could this mess, mishap have been avoided if there was some way that they could have had better data? Um, maybe something in the cockpit that would say, hey, you're not on the center line. Normally, at, at this is nighttime, as you can see, there are green lights they follow, but when there's snow out there, they can't always see the lights. So what, what could have been done to prevent this? Uh, once again, a problem is an opportunity, and when there's opportunity, there's money to be made. I, I think, Jim, uh, I think the data you, you emphasize on is actually real-time data. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and because it's real-time data, uh, especially during weather conditions and or different geographical uh, uh, conditions, I think real-time data can only come uh, in a real perspective uh, uh, based on the landscape that has been taken, where it has been taken from. Uh, in, in this case, I want to bring it back to uh, the image recognition and the image processing that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who did not know, uh, Jim has got four patents uh, with regards to uh, automatic license plate recognition uh, or consumer consumer transactional feedback. Yeah, so he's he's there in terms of uh, 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 image recognition. But a lot of this image recognition uh, real time is is deployed so that you can actually evade uh, accidents. And I think I think if if that has been deployed in a proper manner uh, using cameras and proper imaging uh, that is processed instant instantaneously, I think that would have helped uh, uh, in, in that situation uh, in Chicago O'Hare. Mm -hmm. But adding on, right, uh, I think that image recognition is also uh, uh, being used a lot by e-commerce companies for search and advertising. And I, and I want to relate this back to market demand and how data actually supports market demand. So, you know, what happens in analytics uh, is a lot of deep learning and, and what image recognition can do, it can also be used for customer centric uh, search and find, um, whereby a lot of the marketing and the marketing analytics that is done uh, based on, on social media, uh, commerce and so forth, they actually help uh, sort of uh, the labeling features of, of, of these images and videos that uh, based on algorithms, they can actually search and organize content, right? So now the content uh, allows for the system to be trained uh, to understand and, ident and identify the different images and logos. So what this, uh, I I'm speaking of experience here, so what image recognition actually does is with this image and the data that comes out 
from the image recognition, right? Uh, based on the processing that is done. Uh, even real-time data. Marketers now can even fine-tune and adjust their campaigns uh, by monitoring end-user uh, expressive feelings or facial uh, changes in terms of emotions. Yeah? Now, marketers uh, can then now achieve a better result in terms of the campaigns. And obviously, this uh, allows them for, uh, for better sales. Yeah? So I think uh, what was before uh, just something that was uh, picked up in terms of images, and then you do your studies and, and, and you do uh, further insights. We call them data insights. But now, because of the real time uh, scenario, you can actually be very instantaneous in terms of your, 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 your campaign changes. And I think uh, e commerce and social media has got a big plot in this, uh, in this change. Yeah, yeah uh, I just wanted to get that in, uh, uh, Jim, because I wanted to tie it in uh, in terms of market demand to. Some of the expertise you were showing in terms of image recognition. Professor yeah. Vinesh, I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. Yeah. Uh, spot on. And in fact, uh, one later on, I'm going to talk about video surveillance. But I think to add what you said right here, I know I, I come from the marketing side of, of technology and end caps inside of the supermarket is a great example where if you can dynamically change a display, let's say it's for Coca-Cola, and you can use video cameras to watch and create heat maps. And you, as you said, facial um, expressions, you can monitor to see, do people slow down? Do they turn their head? Do they smile when they see it? Uh, and you can test prices, you can test messages. And that, that kind of feedback is incredible. Prior to joining Quantum, I was with a company, I won't name them outright, but we did a lot of uh, testing, both quantitative and qualitative testing, as we were trying to set the price for a new version of our product. So we knew there were a lot of people who loved our first version and would upgrade to the new version. And in the quantitative study that was done among likely purchasers, the maximum revenue that we expected came at a $499 price point. And this was presented to the CEO of the company as part of the marketing pre-launch plan. And with all that data, this guy, though, he was very experienced. Uh, he was a legend in his own time. He said, I get it. But you know what? We're going out at 549. Because what you've forgotten is that there's a group of people that whether it's 499 or 549 or 599, they're absolutely going to buy it. It's not a question of maybe I will, maybe I won't. So let's just skim all those people at 549. And then three, six months down the road, we can lower it to 499. And then we'll get the maximum revenue. So sometimes you do need to have, uh, I agreed with him, by the way. And so sometimes you do need to have that human override. So one one more thing on the aviation part that is fascinating, maybe even a better example than this. Uh, you probably know the company Garmin for many different industries. Well, Garmin came out with something two years ago that seemed like it was out of science fiction. And a number of airplanes have this already built in, including a company called Cirrus, which is out of the United States. And they make something called the Vision Jet. It's a jet that seats seven people. And what happens is if, let's say, the pilot becomes unresponsive for some reason and you've got six non-pilots in the, in the aircraft, one of those people who has been told ahead of time, if anything happens to the pilot, press this red button in the ceiling. It's, it's like this big. What will happen is Garmin, uh, it's called safe return. It will take over the plane. It will immediately communicate with air traffic control. It will immediately look to where the nearest airport is, make sure it's got the right length of runway. It will use synthetic vision. It will not try and fly you through a mountain to get to an airport that's on the other side. It will go around the mountain or it will go a further distance to get to a different airport. It will tell the passengers exactly what's going on. Like this airport has been chosen, air traffic control has confirmed, and it will take the plane all the way down, land it on the runway and come to a stop. The only thing it won't do is taxi from the runway over to the hangar. But at that point, I'm sure you'll have the fire department and everybody else out there. This is incredible 
futuristic technology that's available now. And I think we're going to see it more and more on other aircraft. That can only be done with data analytics, 100%. Okay, uh, this is, I just wanted to have a picture of a lift to show you. I, I live here in Singapore, as Professor Vinish said, and I live on the ninth floor of my building. And for the first X number of years, the lift would always start at the ground floor. And then one day about a year ago, it suddenly shifted to the basement. And although I haven't inquired about this, I am pretty sure that analytics showed that most of the rides that people make is to the basement where the car park is. So every time a person in the basement has to press the button and then it has to do a one floor you know, uh, transfer. So it's something simple like this. Can you extend the lifetime of the lift by using data to figure out what is the best floor for it to, to be on before somebody calls it? doesn't have to change the world, just little things. Yeah. That's interesting, Jim, uh, because you know why? Uh, in Malaysia, we still have that uh, whole uh, confusion between uh, uh, B, G, uh, hmm. M, F, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and one, two, three. I, I think one of the incubators here in the tech park, uh, the ground floor is actually stated as one. Uh, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's kind of... Uh, there's no standardization uh, and i think uh, the key thing here is standardization but yeah i think if you live in in in, in a in a commercial building or a residential building you want to get to your basement that's because that's where your car is usually parked isn't it mm -hmm. and 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 changing changing the order of uh, the levels uh, which are non-standardized levels yeah it can be a bit uh, confusing so i think uh, yeah that's a good good reference or a good uh, question. Uh, uh, good uh, reflection. Nicholas, you had something you want to bring up? Yeah, uh, about the standardized leaf. Uh, it is always confusing to explain to uh, the outsiders about our APU because the main floor of our campus is actually level three and not stated as ground floor. So yeah, that's definitely uh, confusing. And mm -hmm. speaking of the data collected would help the leaf uh, getting more efficient and prolong its lifespan. Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard about a company like a supermarket that actually collects data on what customer normally purchase like throughout the year annually. So in that sense, they can allocate their storage to be as minimal as possible and not stock all of their products and just only stock an X amount of number of a certain items based on the season. So they can vastly decrease the size of their storage and have more money and more capital investing in other stuff and have a lesser, lesser storage space for their supermarket. So I think data did, uh, definitely plays a very crucial role in this current industry. And that's one of the reasons why I chose my course in data analytics as well. Mm -hmm. Nicholas, you're spot on. I have a couple more stories. This uh, this originally was a build slide, so please don't read too far ahead. I'll just quickly touch on these. So these are meant to be thought questions for you. Uh, could you identify a fire before traditional smoke detectors saving lives in buildings? Uh, if you're wondering how could you do that, I hinted at this before. This, In fact, almost all of these things are possible today, but maybe just not known to you. So one of Quantum's biggest vertical markets is video surveillance and uh, particularly I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, we have an airport in asia that has six thousand video cameras that run seven by 24 uh, every day of the year they're in 4k resolution if you've ever done video on a, a mobile phone and then tried to upload it into your laptop or desktop you know it can take a while imagine six thousand cameras that never stop that takes a lot of throughput, and that's where quantum is really uh, second to none. And so that's why we have video surveillance customers around the world. But analytics is where the real future is for video surveillance. So what's interesting, think about uh, KLIA. If somebody somehow threw a, a cigarette butt that was still lit into a trash can, and you know, KLIA, KLIA has soaring ceilings. So how long would it take 
How much fire would you need for that to reach the ceiling and set off the smoke alarm? But guess what? Video analytics can watch all the time and they can see just a little bit of smoke coming out. They can alert security. Frankly, if you take it to the next level, you could have a fire suppression system in each trash can and it could automatically just spray the trash can and maybe put it out immediately. So look again, problems equal opportunities equal money. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, another one uh, we touched on, I'd say, about can you tell somebody that they have early stage cancer? Unfortunately, there's too many people that have something wrong with them, like the Steve Jobs example, and they're not even aware. And so if you could find a way to do this, uh, that would be incredible. Uh, we talked about point of purchase display, so that, that one I'll skip over. Um, how about cloud servers? Can you increase the uptime of cloud servers? This is actually what we're working with APU on. So um, the reason that we're doing this is that our tape drives are running a lot of the cloud storage that you rely on. So if you have an email account from any of the big folks or you want to see what your friends are doing, I'm trying not to name names, but I think you can follow me. Uh, these are all saved on cloud servers and quite often they're saved on quantum. And so we're working with APU to give APU a very large data set from the past to be able to analyze it and see if there is an algorithm that could be built, just like where we mentioned, can you tell somebody about early stage cancer? Can they go back and build an algorithm that would have been able to identify a problem before it was a problem? Or if there is a problem, can we pinpoint the problem so that we can prevent the downtime. And uh, this is an incredible project. We've got a number of PhDs on both sides working on it. And uh, I just can't wait to see the results. So that's a real example. Uh, is there a way to assist students to learn faster? That one's pretty uh, correct. How about inspiring people to improve their health through better diets? Uh, what if there's just a way that somehow automatically you can be reminding people uh, in California, restaurants now are required to put the number of calories of every dish that's sold. And when I see the cheesecake on there and it says it has 1800 calories and that, you know, I should only be eating 2000 in a day, it does give me pause. So is there a way that, that through data, you can be able to help people make better decisions? Uh, can you empower small businesses to deliver better customer service and increase return customers? Uh, as Professor Vinesh said, one of my patents is in this area. And actually, I have five more that are in process. They just have not been approved yet. And this is really uh, exciting to me. So what I am attempting to do is to be able to help small businesses be able to ask their customers in real time what their experience was like. And uh, I give an example from my childhood where my family had some small businesses, dry cleaners to be exact, and they were in neighboring cities. And if there was a problem at one dry cleaner, for example, a person no-showed for some reason, uh, you could get some very angry customers, rightfully so. And so alerting the manager to, hey, you, you just got two people scoring you one star in real time, the manager can immediately try to address that. Uh, so I already have one patent in this. And as I said, the others are coming. And I hope that it all comes around. And uh, Nicholas uh, or Apple, if you're listening, I want I want to sell this to Apple. So uh, your question was so spot on. So thank you. Uh, another one, could you use data to help the HR department reduce recruitment times? We, we do get a lot of applications for our job. Sometimes the people, I think, uh, have no idea what they're applying for based on their background. But if there is a way for the system to automatically uh, analyze applications, it could help us take and, uh, and narrow down the best candidates. And I think you can see this already in people that apply for loans. The analytics that are done are now done by computer. 
And then uh, can you calculate the most efficient advertising investments? That's exactly what Professor Vinesh was talking about. So uh, I want to say metrics can be manipulated. The, you probably can tell these are pictures of McDonald's. What I want to tell you may or may not apply to McDonald's. So uh, just I don't want to slander anyone. I was in a fast food chain restaurant in a location that I've been many times. So I've had enough of a chance to observe how things are supposed to go. And what I noticed in this chain was that sometimes the system, like you see in the sample photo on the right, was operating properly, which is I placed my order, I have a number, let's say my number is 50. And I can see that 50 is being prepared. And then when 50 is ready to be handed over to me, I move from pr preparing to pick up your order. So that's fine. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. And I'm pretty sure that this chain is measuring the time it takes from the order placement to the order delivery. And if they're smart, they're actually incentivizing their staff to get better at that, or at least meet a threshold, or making them compete against other outlets to see who can be the most efficient. So what, what would happen if, in this following example, what would happen is as soon as I place my order and I find out I'm order number 50, if five seconds later it went from now preparing to delivered and then just disappeared off the screen, but yet my order won't be ready for three minutes. And what if it turns out that every person placing their order had the same thing happen? Well, I brought this to the attention of the general manager of a chain and without confirming, or it seems like maybe the data was being manipulated because somebody in there figured out, oh, my bonus is based on how well we do. So if I just quickly clear the screen, I'm going to be number one. My outlet's going to be number one. So be careful. Metrics can be manipulated intentionally and accidentally. Could just be a, a lack of training. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, bad data will lead you to bad conclusions. Yeah, uh, Mr. Jim, about sure. the payment gateway system, I, I think that's a great uh, data collecting method for improving the customer service. And I've noticed a significant uh, difference from the past and from now, because in the past, if you look at McDonald's, there would be a, a huge line. Basically, everybody is buying lunch or dinner and you need to wait. You need to queue for a long time to get your stuff. But now with this uh, uh, self kiosk that you can order and also pay, it actually speeds up a lot of uh, procedure and it uh, you can also actually order from your phone right now. If I'm not mistaken, there's a order and collect. So basically you can just sit down, find a place and sit down and order and the food will be delivered to you. So definitely the, the data and the system uh, vastly improves our life and bring ease for us to order and make uh, accelerate the process. You're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember, I don't know that Professor Vinesh is, when uh, there wasn't even electronic ordering, I don't mean by a kiosk, but I mean, if people would write down your order and then they would put it on a spinner oh. and it would go to the kitchen and it would just make something and there's no log of it. And at the end of the day, they just have to think about, well, how much butter do we have left? But now it's, it's all done scientifically. I think there are still smaller restaurants that actually have those in place. <laughs> Family-run restaurants. Yeah. Probably so. Well, uh, thank you for your patience. We're just about done. As I uh, tipped already, this is my next project to help small businesses to give them this data. And there's an example of something that um, I'll just take it one step further. Let's use the dry cleaner example. Do, do you guys know dry cleaners? Is that term familiar? Okay. Let's say that in uh, the PJ area, I have a dry cleaner and my average score is 3.7. And when I log into my dashboard from whoever's providing me this, uh, Apple, if you're listening, I'm willing to talk. Uh, let's just say I log in and I find out that my competitors without 
naming them. They just say within a, a 20 kilometer radius of your location, there are dry cleaner competitors and their average score is 4.3. So I suddenly now have data to say, hmm, why am I not doing so well as my competitors? So uh, I think giving this kind of data to small businesses will really help them up their game. Okay. So here are the takeaways that, uh, that I'd like to offer to you. You, you should decide for yourself, but uh, for better or for worse, and I think for the better, the future will be increasingly impacted by AI. So data is the electricity of AI. So anything you can measure, try and measure it. And you don't even know when you're gonna need that data. A lot of our customers will never delete the data because they may wanna go back and look at a data set from five years ago. Um, remember what gets measured gets managed. If you can't measure it, it's possibly not getting managed. Um, I do be, believe data manipulation is a real problem by those that are smart enough to tip the scale. Um, be a data entrepreneur. Just look around and, and ask people. You don't even need to have the answer. Just ask people like, what could make your experience better? What kind of questions do you have? And uh, as I've as I suggested here, if you can identify a problem, you may also be identifying an opportunity. And when there's an opportunity, then you might find yourself the, the entrepreneur that's starting the next unicorn. Or you may just be helping people live longer, more fulfilling lives, whatever it is. I think you guys are in a tremendous area and demand for uh, people with your skill set is pretty much infinite. So I congratulate you for uh, picking the field of data analytics and I can't wait to see what you guys come up with in the future. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's wonderful. I think uh, the slides actually gave us an illustration to some of the points and insights you wanted to bring forward. Uh, I think Nicholas and I will totally agree that uh, data is in the forefront of any new venture, any new actions to be implemented, any new decision making uh, that is to be put, put forward. Uh, I think a lot of the decision making now in terms of business operations actually has got uh, uh, an outcome based uh, relationship to the analytics that is, is, is that is being done based on the data that uh, is sourced, um, whether it is sourced from a third party or whether it is generated by the organization itself. Uh, we've got some questions and I'd like to uh, push the questions of the audience. And the first one is from uh, uh, Saeed. Uh, mm -hmm. How can we stop data uh, to be manipulated? For example, Mr. Simon says, uh, about McDonald's, can we not make up a system automatically or maybe <laughs> set up one person responsible to approve uh, if the order is ready or the order is being prepared? Uh, Simon, do you understand the question? Yeah. So, okay. so thank you for your question. To be clear, I was not talking about McDonald's. I do not want to be sued. <laughs> okay. I was just using a, I, those are the pictures I could find on the internet of a kiosk. Um, so with that, um, how can we stop data being manipulated? What's I'm going to give you a real example. About six years ago, uh, I put on an event in the city of Macau. And it was for people from all over Asia Pacific. They flew in and it was held in one of the large casino hotels. And I just happened to meet the general manager of the hotel uh, downstairs, he, he it turns out he lived in the hotel. So every night he would go down to the restaurant and the bar and just hang out and mingle with people. And so once I found out who he was, I couldn't help myself. I had to ask him a million questions. And so I started asking him about casino gambling from a management perspective. And he said, well, you know, over a large number of gambling interactions, uh, you know, just like the flipping of the coin, those are all independent events. Yes, you might get the odd time when somebody can flip a heads 20 times in a row, 
But the thing is, we look and we look for outcomes that are different than what we would expect to find. And so, for example, if there's a table uh, in a card game where the customers are winning higher than the de- than we would expect, what we do is we don't automatically assume something's wrong. It just gets flagged. And we look at who is the dealer, who is the player. They use facial recognition. And if they see this happen a second time, then they put a person on it and they start watching. Because if you're not aware, the number one way that casinos get cheated is by the employees, not by the customers. Sometimes the customers work in cahoots with the employees, but the employees. So they tell that to the employees and say, yeah, you might get away with it once or twice, but you won't get away with it very long. So that's how you can prevent being manipulated. You call out these unusual outcomes and make sure that everybody knows how could it be that not McDonald's, but some other place has orders that are completed in two seconds. That would be the trigger for me. This person probably thought over a long period of time, it will look very good, but you cannot have orders completed in two seconds, day in and day out. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jim, for answering that question. I was thinking about the same as well, because if you continuously uh, send out the orders immediately after you receive them, it should raise suspicion in the system as well for the management system. And speaking of which, I ha- actually have one of uh, my own questions that I would like to ask you as well. It is, uh, what advice do you have for students like me that are studying in the data analytics course? Mm-hmm. Well, number one, uh, be good at what you're studying. (laughs) That always helps. Whatever it is you're doing, be good at it. Uh, Number two, I would just say be curious, especially in your area. Um, Just everything you look at, say, can I measure this? And if I could measure this, is there some way to do it better? And if you just start looking at that, there would be so many things that are jumping out at you. Your problem is going to be trying to figure out what to do amongst many good choices. So that's my advice. Yeah, speaking of measuring and data collecting, I actually do uh, did some some of the data collection of my uh, current life. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you know that our car uses petrol, right? So mm-hmm. every time I fill out my car, I actually keep a data collection sheet. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see right here. So I do the same. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so these are the entries uh, for the yeah. dates, uh, the amount of uh, liter of oil that are, uh, uh, the liter of petrol, and mm-hmm. the price. And mm-hmm. after each uh, fill, I will record the distance uh, reach as well. Mm-hmm. So basically, based on this data uh, from the past, I can use it as uh, a fuel consumption rate to see how much fuel uh, my car usually uses over a certain distance. And I can calculate the amount of uh, money spent on the covered distance. So yeah, that's a a little data collection from myself that I would like to share. Nicholas, I I feel like I'm looking in a mirror. I I do exactly the same every fill up. uh, Mine's in Excel and I don't do it out except out of curiosity. And what is, I, I bought a used car a few months ago. And so what I found is the, my, I, I use it in the US way, which is miles per gallon MPG. And I find that it ranges from like 29.9 to 32.2. Yet I don't think my driving style or my routes differ very much week in, week out. So I'm really mystified. Why am I getting different mileage uh, weekend from one week to the other. And so that's been uh, on my mind. It sounds like we share something similar in that regard. Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with Nicholas because I remember I had a friend who, who had a small notepad uh, just above uh, his seat. Uh, uh, he, he, would, he would pull down uh, the mm-hmm. sunscreen uh, protector and that would be slotted there. He would manually write uh, uh, the uh, data that he had in terms of kilometers against petrol uh, price, uh, petrol is paid for. Uh, we've got another question uh, from Tay. Uh, is data analytics effective in helping expanding business overseas because only some sectors such as petrol sectors 
cannot be measured uh, in data. Jim. Oh, let's see. I, I, uh, I'm, re, I'm rereading it because I got distracted by a WhatsApp that came in. Sorry. Um, expanding business overseas. Oh, yeah. Um, absolutely. The nice thing about data is that, see, there's more. Sorry about that. Uh, the nice thing about data is that data doesn't necessarily have any biases built in. If you think back to what I was mentioning about the police chief, he was saying that what might be a valid stop can be invalidated by the defense claiming that there was some sort of bias, especially an illegal bias. But the ALPR doesn't know who's driving the car, doesn't care. So therefore, in, in a court of law, when you present this and you say, so, Mr. Policeman, why is it that you pulled over my client? Is it because he is X, Y, Z? You say, no, it's not me. The computer saw the license plate and ran it and the car was registered as stolen. That's when I decided to pull over the defendant here. And now all of a sudden, everybody's like, well, then it must be a valid stop. So, uh, you know, in terms of international, it can really help. Uh, but keep in mind that the way if you're collecting data, always be on the lookout for accidental biases of, of the data. So uh, people may not understand the question. And for those of you that have a, a marketing background, you know that there are plenty of examples where you have something that's misinterpreted. Um, you know, there was in advertising, Electrolux is famous for their, um, their slogan. Um, you know, Electrolux said, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. That was for their vacuum cleaner, uh, kind of accidental one. Um, General Motors was marketing a car in Mexico. And uh, the, the car in English is called the Nova, like in the sky, Nova. But in Spanish, that translates into no go. So you have these kinds of issues here. So be careful. Uh, I know that's not a direct correlation, but if you are accidentally biasing the responses, then you're going to have bad data. So be looking out for that. Maybe have somebody local test that data for you first. Thank right. you for I, think, I think, Jim, we don't have any further questions. And I think you, you were spot on in both the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I think we're going to call it a wrap, uh, Jim uh, and Nicholas. Uh, it was a wonderful hour of uh, insights on how data, uh, in terms of where it has come from, uh, how it is utilized uh, in terms of uh, uh, market penetration, market improvements. Uh, a lot of the examples you, you gave us were, were really an eye opener. I could relate to them because uh, they're all American based uh, examples. I like the part about the, the sports and and the Super Bowl, which was just uh, two days ago, uh, and how uh, a lot of the new uh, developments uh, in in payment gateways and also in terms of uh, 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 kiosks being produced and things like that, and how it has changed business uh, in totality. Uh, but what I can say is that at the end of the day, it is customer uh, centric. Uh, approaches uh, are, are important in any business venture and data analytics uh, helps us improve market demand and that market demand actually re relates uh, has a very direct relationship uh, towards customer satisfaction and customer needs yeah and i think what you shared today are uh, experiences and case studies which actually uh, are spot on on the topic uh, for the day uh, Jim, uh, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I, uh, we're, we're happy that uh, Quantum is collaborating with APU. Uh, happy to have you back on campus for a physical visit as soon as you can. Uh, borders are opening on the 1st of March, I heard, uh, which means that you can fly in and uh, fly in directly to KL. And please make APU your stop or one of your stops uh, in your next visit to, to, to KL. Uh, Nick? Thank you for uh, being my partner in crime this evening. Uh, it was another wonderful uh, enterprise uh, Wednesday. Uh, we have not lost ground. We have gained strength uh, from 2021 and 2022. Uh, uh, it is a is a very good start uh, with today's session. So Jim, 
you were the first uh, guest uh, for 2022. Thank you for your time. Uh, we wish you all the best in terms of your ventures for 2022 with Quantum. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone again on Enterprise Wednesday uh, in two weeks' time, yeah, where we will have another wonderful session for you all. Uh, so to everyone who, who is online, uh, thank you for, for your time this uh, evening and have a wonderful uh, uh, evening ahead and uh, stay safe, yeah, uh, and always keep uh, uh, being positive, yeah. So thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a great thank evening. Thank you, Jim. Take thank care. You. Yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, everyone.